Ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause to Eugene! Okay, so, um, thank you very much for being here. Thanks you should for say thanks for having me, exactly. Everyone says that. I've tested everyone you say thank you for being here to say thanks for having me. I'm trying to find a more innovative phrase for the speakers now. And Eugene. So tell me just like you studied, you lived in the US and you came back to Malaysia and uh, you were working at Accenture at a point. So two questions. Why did you start a business and why did you start an online business? So why start a business and why online? Actually, I kind of stumbled upon like starting a uh, car uh, I When I came back, it was like um, I just wanted a job that paid well. And apparently, 10 years ago, Accenture paid really well. Um, and then I applied and got in. And uh, after like the first project that was like six to eight months, I really wanted to leave. Then my mom didn't allow me to leave. <laughs> Just because she said like I had to get uh, promoted before I, I, I left to pursue my own stuff. Uh, her rationale is actually pretty smart. She said like you, you gotta get promoted. So when if you fail in your venture, then when you actually go back to the job market, you don't start as a fresh grad again. So I, I, I stayed there for two years, got promoted, then I left. But the problem came when I left because uh, my dad actually uh, runs a couple of uh, dealerships. So you can imagine like. Um, he got his dealership really early. It's a Proton dealership, one of them. Uh, that was in the early 90s, where you could just sell whatever that's batch Proton, right? So uh, this was like in 2006, 2007-ish, whereby uh, Perdua is already in the market, and uh, Proton, the, the sales has been tanking. So my dad had a huge amount of problem with the, the outlet, so I actually went in there to help. Uh, I told him I'd, I'll give him like a year, Ended up, I stayed like one and a half years, but throughout the time there, I actually kind of like got into college because I was trying to sell cars online instead of being restricted to uh, a brick model kind of model. Now, you told me a little bit of your story, but uh, so just for everyone to know, I'd like to make the my asking questions as short as possible so that you get to know a bit of the story and take it to the crowd to ask questions and talk more about, more about your startups and the questions you have. So I'm going to jump straight to the fact that uh, you are not the only one, for sure, doing something similar to what you're doing. Yet, Patrick Grove started harassing you. So, uh, I want to know about that story, but before like knowing details of how did this approach started, and how did he start getting interested, tell me what do you think you did from the beginning, which was different from your competitors? I think, I think when we started, we realized that uh, we really needed to have the contact, so in the classified business, it's always having the largest listings, the largest selection. If you're a user, you want to go to a website that uh, has the best selection to, so that you, you can find a bigger model. And we looked in the, the, the marketplace, there there wasn't one that is gradually building uh, the inventory of listings across time. So, but the problem came was like, um, we, we, we gave ourselves like a, a two months period because we didn't want the data to kind of deteriorate to actually build like 5,000 cars. So we figured like, uh, we got to collect, so initially we built a database of uh, all the dealers in Malaysia. We kind of grouped them into clusters and then we, we did an uh, estimate how many people needs to be sent there to, to get the pictures, front back, uh, the price and stuff like that. But what happened was when we actually hit the milestone of 5,000, we, we were really happy, but unfortunately Muda was like, you know, going along together with us and uh, yeah, so, so that, that's what happened. But how did you think about it? I mean, um, you, how did you know from the beginning how much money, for instance, did you start to... You got like 30 people to work for you from the beginning. It, it, so, it's, it, it's, um, a lot of people don't believe in writing business plans. I think a lot of you guys here, like as founders as well, as well uh, has never written a business plan per se, most probably. How, how many of you guys have written a business plan? Okay. Less than, I don't know, like five of you, like six. Um, I think writing a business plan in Malaysia is really important uh, just because this is, you know, there's this argument that uh, it, it's also valid as well. You go to Silicon Valley and then people just start on the, a new business without doing anything, without having any financial projections. 
because the, the ideas that, that they come up with, it's, it's noble, right? You don't really know, you, you can't really anticipate the market. But if you're actually copying someone from overseas, you already pretty much know the progression. How is it going to pan out? And uh, the other thing is, funding-wise, the valuation that you actually get here in Malaysia, it's, you know, you don't really have that kind of runway, that kind of uh, budget to actually pivot. So if you go to the States, you know, it's, it's more fluid, the valuation is higher, you get a huge amount of seed capital, then you, you can just plan as you go. If you screw up, you kind of like, you know, you still have money to, to spend to, to, to turn things around. But in Malaysia itself, I guess that's the critical thing. People run out of money more often than not. That's why they quit. It's not that they don't really get like, you know, traction compared to money, like, in my personal opinion. So how does that impact fundraising actually? Because as you say, there's an ecosystem in the US that even if you fail, you end up selling your setup somehow. I so here, people run out of money. So how, that, how did this mindset impact your company fundraising? <laughs> uh, what happened was like, I, I, I wrote the plan and then I pitched it to my parents. And then my parents was like really against it. They didn't know what this was because like, you know, it's building something online. Uh, they brought me to see a family friend, which is in the finance industry. And uh, the first question that came out of his mind is like, when can I get my money back? And he, keep, he kept pressing me, it's like, you know, do I get it in the second year? Do I get it in the third year? And I told him, I don't know, but we are going to build something of value that is going to be worth a lot of money uh, because of uh, the business model itself um, and the revenue model itself. So uh, then it, it was like, he didn't buy it. Then I went to seek my friends. Uh, the investors are all actually my friends from uni and uh, a guy from high school. So um, they all chipped in the money and initially without anything, without anything whatsoever, just the business plan, they, we, I, I managed to get like 500K, right? So like 80% of them, 80% of the funding was from friends and then the rest came from the, the family. So I think you have to go back to your financials. I think a lot of um, startups today, they don't raise enough to actually last them for like one and a half, two years, you can't just like, you know, like take a take a break from your work and say like, I'm gonna work at this for six months or one year to see if I gain traction. Usually it doesn't take, you know, that short of a, a time frame. And as, uh, what's his name again? Ivan, okay, <laughs> Ivan realized. Uh, usually, you know, it's, it's everything beyond two years. Everything, it's usually beyond two years. So you really have to have that kind of war chest to actually ensure that you give yourself, yourself a, a shot. The other thing that why you, you would actually go seek the funding, that kind of amount, is based on the market valuation. If you cannot do a financial projection that says, if someone is giving you half a mil now, and then you kind of compare what the earnings of half a mil now to like five years down the road, if the person actually invested in a, a property market per se, or a, you know fixed income, whatever it is, what are the kind of exponential returns that person should get? So this is purely based on revenue model, not on acquisition. So it, it's more like the market can sustain. It will you you get a, a tenfold kind of return if you you know the, if everything goes along with the, the projection itself. Does that make sense? So basically, what I see you did, first of all, your friends who are friends from university who were your angels, were they angels from before? No, I, I think it's the first time. One of them, I haven't seen him in like, I don't know, seven, eight years. There's a guy that I rarely see, but we are always online. He's like my senior. And then uh, there's two other guys, which, you know, they're, they're like, uh, we went to the same course together in, in uni. Okay. So, and so they, you were basically their first angel investment on a tech. I think there's only one guy that has invested before. I okay. think they're, they're run. But the, the, the guys that I approach, they all run their own businesses. So it might be their first angel investment, but they are already pretty seasoned uh, business people. They run their own companies. But uh, uh, the point I'm trying to understand is actually what you were saying where you compare your revenue projection to the other industries in the market is when you don't have an ecosystem where people are familiar with maybe acquisitions, exits, and valuation, you might need to bring the numbers to something that's like close to their mindset. 
I, I think it's very easy for us to sell this because in the car classified uh, space, you already have Job Street, which is already uh, the same model, right? Then you already have I Property, which is already the same model. And as people can see, and as you guys can validate it as well, you pay a lot of money to Job Street for a posting. And the market actually is that huge. The revenue is actually that huge. So it's, it's pretty similar with uh, cars as well. And uh, so how much in your equity did it mean? You said you got 500K yeah. at the beginning. So how much did you give it? We kind of valued the company at uh, 1 mil. So we actually gave out like 50% just to get the, the, the 500K. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is for me quite interesting because uh, before talking to him, I was a delegate of like, don't give too much of your equity. Like, don't give in. But what what you understanding? Emerging markets is I, I'd rather listen for you. But if if you need five five hundred k, you still need five hundred k to survive two years and and not run out of money. I, I, I think there's a lot of people that has uh, problems with uh, raising money because of the you know either the business plan is not there, the financial projection is not there to justify your value of your company itself, per se, right? So at, when you start your company, if there's no valuation, a minimal, I would say, even if it's, think about it, it's like, what can 100K buy you today? What can 200K buy you today? You know, you, you're taking a, uh, account of the office space, you're taking account of uh, salary, you're taking account of uh, marketing, and then you, you kind of like multiply that by two because there's always a lot of like screw ups along the way. So I, I don't think that kind of validation is, you know, it's, it's huge. It's actually pretty minimal. But a lot of people kind of underestimate how much they should start with. Okay. This also means side. So I'm going to jump straight forward to the moment when, not yet, actually, within the costs you mentioned the, of like getting great people in, which is also some people bootstrap and save on this, I wanted to share how you did it. Because you told me you hired like 30 interns and what happened with these interns? <laughs> and I think a lot of the interns are here today. They've been with the company for a few years and then uh, they're okay. all running the, they're running the group that we have right now. They should raise your hands, interns. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't know how to explain this. We needed listings, and then what, what we realized is like the car dealers themselves, they're, they're pretty much, at that time I guess, they're, they're pretty much lazy, they, they don't really know how to like, even if they knew how to actually take a picture from their digital cameras, they don't know how to transfer it to their computer and upload it on the website. So it was really tedious, so we figured like, uh, we, really, we really needed to send teams to go out to actually cycle through Client Valley to get the listings, to ensure that we're number one in listings, that's why the traffic will come. Then you think about when you actually hire someone and uh, how much would you be willing to pay that someone to do this kind of job. Then it came it came down to like if you were to pay someone two thousand to, today to do this, that person most probably will not come to work after like maybe two weeks or whatever. Or that's the quality that you you'll be expecting, right? So, but interns are totally different, right? This was like I don't know, this was like how many years ago? Five years ago, interns was like totally different. Malaysia, Malaysian unis had this ruling, right? Like, had this this structure whereby interns have to, they have to go and get an internship before they can graduate. And it's it's based on grades as well. So like, we kind of started offering like a thousand bucks to get interns. And from this internship itself, we kind of like um, split. So we will send like a, a team of, let's say, a, a team is consists of two percent, we'll give them digital cameras, we give them a huge like, you know, multiple battery packs. Uh, a GPS where the location is because everything that we do it's tagged on a database and, uh, on Google Earth, and then uh, we, we kind of estimate how many, how much they can cover on that day itself. So we will have like five to six teams going out, and then when they bring the, the data back, so this is like a lot of pictures, right? And as well as the like year, make, model, price, uh, and then there's people like interns doing data entry. And then uh, there's also interns doing uh, custom, uh, what we call like ICS customer service, like calling, calling the, uh, the dealers themselves. So we kind of structured a program ultimately that we could actually rotate the interns around so that they actually are exposed to different things. And we found that it's like throughout like two, three years, there were like 400 interns, 400 plus interns that actually came through our program. And with that itself, we kind of like recruited the ones that we felt that you know had a huge potential to 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 go full time 
and actually to, to continue grooming them. It's a lot of work, but I think it's you know it's it's fair game for the, the price you're paying as well as the amount of people that you can actually see across the company. Because if you were to hire people like full time, full, uh, for a full time position, it's it's a huge headache. Yeah. At the very least, the interns themselves, if they're not up to spec, they leave in three months anyway. <laughs> but that was really smart, and I, everything you say, I imagine how would a company replicate today. But the smart way, one, not to get anyone tired because they were rotating. And I wanted to share the cases of the interns who are here now, or who are actually are part of your recording. Who are they? What, what did they do? And I think the first guy we recruited is Wing Fu. He's a set up, set up. He, he runs uh, HR and finance for the group, so uh, if you have any issues with Cradle application, he's like an expert. Uh, <laughs> you can ask him. About it. <laughs> okay. So, that's okay. Okay, uh, the, the second guy, it's like Coxen, he's like the CEO because he's like the smartest guy in the company. He's even smarter than me, although I scold him all the time just for fun. <laughs> but, uh, and, what's your name? So, Elvin yeah. is, 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 is back there, he's, uh, he's doing products, all the product stuff across the group is actually under him. So, um, yeah. Awesome. And um, did you hire any senior people, like senior, already senior positions? What we had was like, initially when, we, when I started, my co-founder is actually from uh, Michael, his name, he's actually from IBM. So he did all the tech stuff. And then uh, I, I pulled two other person from Accenture, my ex, you know, my ex colleagues. And then they actually kind of groomed them with this, trying to build this pyramid because we had a huge amount of interns that just needed parenting or whatever. I don't know. And uh, for tech talent developers, did you hire senior or did you have only Michael? We we had issues hiring like everybody else. I think it's it's more like it goes back to the funding again. A, a lot of people had this. I wouldn't say naive, they were optimistic that, you know, I will hire the best people I can find. You know, initially when you start, you want all the shit help people, and then you go and pitch, pitch, and then like, you know, maybe you get one out of like five, and then the person that you figure like shit hot, when it's in that startup environment, they're not that suitable, and then you kind of have to churn. Then when you churn itself, your projection goes out of whack. Whatever that you raise, it's, it's kind of burned. So we, we had this issue as well, but the benefit of having a, a CTO, that is a co-founder, that it's someone that you trust, is that they can actually validate for you who they hire and tell you whether this person is legit or not. That person doesn't, your co-founder, if you're doing a tech startup or anything web-based, that person doesn't have to be the smartest programmer or the best programmer there is. What he should just do is tell you whether this person is legit or not. What I see uh, today when, when entrepreneurs come up to me and say, there's a lot of people that don't know tech, and then they're looking for a, for a CTO, and then they hire someone, and then they have never met, uh, worked with them before, they don't really know, understand their language, and what do you go by? Do you trust that person into spending your cash, into recruiting people that you don't really know what they do? And Michael, you actually were colleagues, like friends from uni. We, yeah, we were friends from uni. He was like the smartest guy in the class. Oh, <laughs> you're lucky. And, uh, well, and jumping uh, forward to the last series of questions I actually want to ask before jumping to the crowd. So you guys already can start filling the gaps and thinking of questions you want to ask that I'm not asking. Um, tell, I want to know the story behind the acquisition and specifically also about your relation with Patrick Grove. People many times see acquirers and acquired, but there's actually like, a, a personal, I don't know, relation behind that that I want to yeah, understand. I, I mean, it, it, yeah. Initially, we were like really um, cautious, like everybody else. So, uh, how, how, how did it first happen? The first contact, how did it go? Uh, less than a year after we went live, I think it's like the 10th to 11th month, we started getting inquiries to actually uh, acquire the company itself. Um, and there were a couple of like really huge companies trying to acquire us. And then we felt it wasn't time, and uh, one day Patrick just called, and then we, I, I, I went to meet him, and then like he kind of presented something to me, and then it's 
kind of like across two years, so you have to give him credit, right? He's, he worked really hard and he's, he was really consistent and actually, you know, every two weeks he will actually call me and say how things, like you come to the office, you go for lunch, and yada, yada, yada. I think he has a bad rep outside. Sometimes people say like, you know, he's a shock or whatever. I don't think that's the case. I think he has given us everything that we've asked for and even more. I think the, the team members can validate that. I, I just think it's like, um, and if you think he's good at doing deals, wouldn't you want him to be on your side if he actually comes and inquire you? Then, you know, it's, it's, it's the best people on the team. So, I, yeah, that's the kind of relationship. But I guess what uh, he was actually, in, uh, why he was actually so interested, because the, the courting period is like across two years. Every time we went back to him, we showed him amazing numbers. We showed him like fantastic growth. So like he was like, you know, he, he just, um, and if you could like, did you work for a while with Patrick Grove? Like, actually, when team? we, the moment <laughs> we listed, I was out after a month. But why did you quit? If you can, why did you decide to quit? It was okay. There was some personal stuff, inside stuff that I guess these guys know, mm -hmm. but I can't touch on that. But there's also a professional reason why I think you need to s step back. At the end of the day, when you list, so we went to like Thailand and Indonesia with acquire sites, right? And then um, it ultimately is a public listed company. There's a lot of things a public listed company has to do to show numbers on a quarter to quarter basis. It's no longer the best product, you know, it's no longer the, the best people because they need it now. Now, there's another reason why I felt like, you know, I, I should leave besides whatever happened uh, in the office. It was because I didn't want, it's listed, right? You could just buy the stock. I mean, like, if you actually believe in the company, you can actually believe in the, the model itself, you could just buy the stock. So there's really not much you can actually impact if you actually think the macro level of it sustains the company. And I didn't want it to be like, I'm just there to um, ride on whatever that is already there. I felt like I would be really lazy if I didn't leave and do something else with my life, I would just be very comfortable and like, you know, just uh, collecting my salary and like, you know, winning the project. Yeah, but it, because everybody had equity, it's, it's, it's more like, um, I didn't want, and, and the funny thing is like, after we couldn't sell the shares for like a year, Patrick couldn't sell for two years. So like, we can sell for one year. And uh, when it was time to sell, a few months after we could sell, I kind of divested everything. Why? Because I felt I didn't want to be tied with the companies. I mean, it's kind of like I didn't want to be living on the company's growth. Does that make sense? I think you, you know? Keep explaining. Okay. <laughs> it's more like um, if you have X amount of dollars, okay? So these are like a lot of money and you're all set and you don't want to work anymore, you go buy Facebook. You buy Facebook's shares because you know it's solid. You know over time it's gonna go up. And that, that creates a sense of like security which makes I think makes me lazy. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's the same as like you take all the money and then you cash out and then you buy properties and then you just sit at home. So I didn't want that to actually feel like, you know, it, I didn't want to cop out. I, I, I just felt like it, this is not me. So, um, yeah. And the other thing about, <laughs> the other thing about exiting, it's like, there's something money can buy, which is time. And there's a lot of things whereby when the money is tied to the equity, you can't do. So, uh, I never had any single properties, or property or whatever, then. And a lot of my friends that were like peers working in uh, the copper world, across the years, they've like, you know, down payment, invested, flip, yada, yada, yada. So I actually kind of had to experience how it's like buying a property. And I didn't want to wait for experience sake. So I did a lot of things whereby I could just like, you know, I leave and then I could just experience life without trying to um, gain more in regards to like just staying there and kind of like experience life because I didn't want to wait, right? 
imagine if I stayed there and I stayed there for like two years or whatever, then I realized I had to, you know, this is not for me again, then I would have wasted two years not really experiencing life. Does that make sense? That's deep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it makes sense. If I can just rephrase that to myself to understand it, it's basically like, Okay. You know, okay. There, there's a lot of things I, I can't say as well what I did, but then again, it's like even starting this group, right? If I stayed there, and if the if I stayed there, <laughs> this will never happen. If 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 I stayed there, there's a lot of other investments that I did will never happen. So I think it's trying to live life the way you want it want to, rather than banking on a company that's solid that pays you X amount on a monthly basis. And everybody is working towards you know the share price going up, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. This actually makes a lot of sense, and I notice that many times what keep us stuck in life yeah. it are good things, yeah. good situations. So something great happens to you in life. Instead of opening yourself for more good, you hold on to that, and you stop growing, and you start becoming unhappy and more fearful of losing you. I, I am actually more fearful. I, I think a lot of my angels tells me like. Eugene, it's like, you know, like, you're worse now, it's like, you know, now you have this amount and then like, you know, you just want to protect it or whatever. And then I think I'm more skeptical, I, I guess when people get older, you know, they've seen the same story or whatever, they, they're more skeptical. But it doesn't mean that I don't take risks, I, 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 I think I'm just more aware of what's happening, more mature now. Well, that's an interesting insight and the decision you made makes sense to keep you moving. And we're going to talk about what you're doing now. I think that's an obvious question the crowd can ask. Okay. Just uh, if I may take a little bit more of your time. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, what are the things you could, if you could summarize that, first of all, you built a marketplace, which I personally, on my opinion, is one of the trickiest business models you need to build. And maybe the rules of a marketplace don't apply to every other business. But if you could summarize the key learnings that for you are fundamental and replicable to other founders. I, I, this, is like, this is like huge, right? The, the, the scope yeah. is huge. A lot of times you actually go to um, events, startup events and whatnot. Uh, you have people telling you what to do. You have people to, uh, advising you how you actually should structure your company. Nobody really knows. The fact is, is nobody really knows. It's either personal branding or they, they tended for the event, they got it, or whatever it is. Nobody knows on the ground level as much as you do in regards to your business itself, how your customer reacts, how uh, whether they're willing to pay X amount, so on and so forth, like whether you actually get enough visitors. But what's most important is like, you know, you number one, you understand why you're actually in the business itself. I'm, I'm personally, I'm not the kind who wants to build a really you know, like cool, whatever, whatever, right? Uh, a, a product. I'm, I'm, I don't think. I don't even think I'm the type that wants to actually change the industry. I just wanted to be financially independent and uh, make enough money so I don't have to worry about it uh, that much. And I wanted to actually ensure that the guys in the company itself exited with, you know, comfortable amount as well. That we can actually continuously replicate what we did previously. I think it's 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 going on pretty well in that in that regards. So that was my main reason. If if you meant you asked me it's like if sweeping the floor makes money, then so be it. We'll sweep floor and it's scalable and you can actually list it, I think it's fine. So I don't have that, but so you have to actually understand it yourself, like why are you doing what you're doing so that you have longevity. You, you actually help you with per perseverance. It actually help you with not giving up. The other thing, it's like, um, I think we, we, we had a discussion with this about this um, yesterday in a different setting. Uh, when startups, like someone like Ivan comes to me for help, and then I tell him, it's like, why do you take shortcuts and whatever? And then people are very um, sensitive. It's like, I, I say like, oh my God, you come to me with this problem. Die la, it's lot already now. You, why did you take this shortcut? Like, why you didn't do this, didn't do that? Then people like, sensitive ma, I never sleep every day, I work so hard. You know, I don't even get much salary, whatever, whatever, right? And then they kind of like, you know, uh, get upset. Like. But what I mean is like, when you actually take shortcut at the top, at the start, everything propagates down for you. 
So uh, for people who don't know tech and they want to get on the uh, web.com or a tech company, I think it's very important to work with self. It's either you pick up a book first before you, you go into a dot com, uh, unless you know, like for, for in, in, in my case, you know someone that you know it's 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 you can trust to be a co-founder. Uh, but then again, that's a risk as well. What if the co-founder after a year he leaves, right? Or you should just join those that are totally they, they don't know anything about tech. They should just join a software house per se, like six months, one year to learn at the very least. You can do testing, you can do like um, customer service, you can do like uh, usability test. Oh, there's a lot of stuff you can actually do within the software house itself to actually learn the technologies that will apply later on. Then we talk about funding itself. A lot of people like, they find it so hard to actually get funding. After they get like 50K, they get very excited. 100K, they straight away go. Right, I don't care what it is, I'm gonna incorporate this company, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, gonna hire whatever. They don't bother with the, the, the financial projections, they don't do the business plan. Then it comes to a lot, it's like recruitment as well. Oh, I cannot find people, I so no choice, I, I take that person. There's a lot of, stop, there's, there's, there's quite a number of startups I see that can never sustain the type of talent that they want, ideally, because the market size that they are doing doesn't justify because the margin is really slim. The, the example that we had yesterday, uh, I shouldn't name the company, but it's okay. Um, so what happens is like when your margin is slim and you don't fix the revenue model, you don't fix your business plan, you will never get that funding, that sizable funding, and you will not have the funds to actually sustain your talent that you actually want to build. All right, does that make sense? So everything kind of propagates down. Just don't take shortcuts, just don't skim. If you, you really tell yourself like if you actually do a business plan and the, the, the projection actually comes up okay, you multiply it by two and go and raise that amount because the multiply by two is all the delays and all the whatever that comes along the way. Wow, that's actually really good. And I would summarize that I wouldn't expect it to be such a deep guy. Sorry for that. <laughs> but I really find it amazing that, I'm kidding, but that you said uh, many things that boil down from that, but basically first, get to know yourself and deeply your why, so you sustain your decisions in the long term and work on growing yourself at the same time. That's what the, these are the two things you said, and then you develop on many other stuff like hiring and market size, but deeply, it's just like, there are no formulas. It's just like you knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it. The better, the better you are at working with yourself and not taking shortcuts early on and across time, the less susceptible you are to, um, let's say, for example, a lot of people, let's just talk about this, this is fun. Like, a lot of people, like, uh, recently they, they, there's this huge argument about, you know, uh, is that the word, grand, grand entrepreneur and, like, entrepreneur, right? So like, there's this huge argument, like, you know, like, entrepreneur people getting money from government or grants, this kind yes, of thing. Yes, yes. So, um, Carlis is actually a recipient of CIP 500, if you guys are familiar with the Cradle system. And uh, what happens is like this, right? There's a lot of people like complaining, oh, you know, um, we, we submitted and we didn't get it, you know, they don't understand what we're trying to do, uh, so on and so forth. If you're, you're strong enough in regards to funding, if you're strong enough in regards to funding, you don't really need this to survive. If you're strong regard, in regards to funding and cash flow, because you raised enough, you're not susceptible to the delays that they will come up with. Because a lot of people complain, right? Inverse, reimbursement or whatever takes forever. The company doesn't have money to run, so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot of things later on, if you actually do everything right at the start and continues to do right, you're actually protecting a company. Does that make sense? Can also tweet later. It, it, it's not only this, it's it's in regards to like uh, uh, talent wise, if you recruit well, it's in regards to like uh, com competitors. When people come and say want to merge or want to, you wouldn't doubt. It's, it's like if you know yourself, you, you, you hire well, and you're happy every day going to work, and these are the people that you actually want to be successful or fail with, why worry about somebody else? It's just distraction. Mm -hmm. I'm writing down just, I don't know if you guys are tweeting some things, but I really find this tweet.
equitable and good to share with everyone. And especially in the era of Lean Startup, which is already a methodology that's kind of last week, but still the bootstrapping thing, people follow the formulas because they're comfortable, right? They give you an illusion of certainty. If you follow the formula, it's gonna work. But as you say, like, you didn't follow bootstrap in any of these rules. And I'd really like to see how that became what is definitely a success story for Malaysia. I, I, you, you really have to understand the, the industry itself, do your homework to analyze, because what you actually need to get to, to some place, it's like, it's like if I were to ask you to actually do the lean startup to build a house, you need raw material, right? You like, you, you get what I'm saying? How long will that take you? Yeah, you probably like lay brick by brick, and then like after a year, you know, put the door on and whatnot, so on and so forth. But it'll take you like forever to actually get the house up. So I think you really have to understand. And it goes back to like, you know, learning about self, learning about industry. Don't take shortcuts, just. Thank you very much. I took longer than I expected, but it was really good. And I'm gonna take it to the crowd. So who has questions here? Awesome. Hi, so uh, my question is around the car industry. Okay. So I think you started around 2000 and... We went live to February 2009. Right, so that's quite late because I, I think Motor Trader was already there, yeah. and then Auto Trader, and then you have the whole association stuff. So when you went in, okay. did you, was it like, hey, uh, finding you know business from those car dealers was no problem, or did you actually face a lot of impediments? I think those guys were, were doing us a favor because what happened is like there's a lot of like, if you're the only guy, you're the first guy to actually get in the market with, like, in that time, you would really have to educate a lot, a lot of dealers how this actually works because they're so used to, like, advertising on the, the magazine and that's it. Or the newspaper, you know, you have a few lines and, and so on and so forth. You would have to spend so much amount of money, like, just educating these people, sending people there, teaching them how to actually upload, how to actually edit, you know, so on and so forth. So I think they actually help. In regards to understanding the industry itself, I, I thought we had a, a window. I thought we would have a window, but Muda just made it so much harder. <laughs> it's like, it's, 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 I wouldn't say it's out of nowhere. I think it's like, you know, we didn't know what we were getting into, but then that blind faith actually served us as well. But we, when we look at uh, Motor Trader, they've been around for, for, for a long time, and their website was, we, we felt we could actually do a better job. I think Job Street, was, uh, I talked to Mark as well, so it's, it was like, you know, a uh, stepchild kind of syndrome, which is not part of the core business and so on and so forth. So I, I actually pretty, I, I knew what was happening with the industry. It was just like the Muda component was just alien to me. Okay, so uh, just a follow up then. Uh, what was like the greatest challenge you had in kind of scaling up your business? You, you practically really have to throw away your life for like how many years to actually, uh, X amount of years to exit. And these guys know what I mean. <laughs> I don't do day to day with them anymore, but they seen how I work. I was sleep in the office, a room there. I like every single thing, anything you talk to me about, it's about Carlos. Nothing else mattered. The, the moment like we list, list, listed the thing, and I resigned, then I took my parents to a holiday because I felt so guilty. It's like for the past X amount of years, you know, it's like maybe I'll see you once in two weeks. That it's it's that kind of engagement. And then like not to mention about all my other friends, like, you know, I will have so many reasons why I cannot make it to your wedding. But it was just because of Carlis. And it, it, it it's just that. So I, I guess you just have to be prepared to actually let that go. So blood, sweat and tears. I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't glorify it, it's just, it's just more like it's a very rational thought, right? It's a very rational thought. You don't have enough money, you're racing against time. If I'm sitting here watching TV, I'm actually screwing everybody over. So as the CEO or the founder or whatever, I think that that has to come back to you in some way or another. And it gets stronger, that motivation gets stronger. I hope it translates to you, Goksen. I hope it translates to you, Goksen. It gets stronger when your company grows and you know when you actually hire people uh, what happens is like you you have to hire people that perhaps a lot of people don't believe in what you're doing then across time you and we went through this as well yesterday um, you have to explicitly show them or share with them some financials or, or some 
progress, then they kind of believe in the company. Because when, when, when I told these guys that, hey, we're gonna get rich, they don't believe at all. They didn't, they didn't believe, they, they didn't buy what, what, what I had to say. And Wing Fu was like, are we gonna be able to make like, you know, a payroll this month and, and so on and so forth. But across time when they actually see the progress, they actually see the investors. You know, the, all the emails, I, I don't, it's, it's not only for, if Patrick sends something to me, usually I will just forward to them because it's, it's like a group thing, it's like a validation that this is actually worth X amount of dollars. When you actually hire people, I guess what's most important is that you would have to start from the first guy is the hardest to recruit, and then the, the second guy you get is the second hardest to recruit. But once you have a core team, it really helps you work harder <laughs> because you don't want to fail them as well, right? Hi, I'm Dominic. Um, thanks Hi. for sharing. Um, I'm actually quite interested to know more about the process of about you getting the, the very first interns and why well, I say uh, getting on board your, your talent team, right? The, the, the beginning part, like, do you use some sort of directory? Do you like go to the college themselves or what? It, it, it's more like, I have X amount of money, I need these listings. How do I get these listings? Even if I pay the dealers to, to get me the listings, most probably they won't actually get me the listings, right? So um, we, we, we kind of like figure like, what do we do? Do we go with part-timers? You know part-timers are freelancers, and I guess the consistency of the work itself is, is you, you can't, I mean, it's, it's, it's common knowledge, right? The commitment level, but with interns is really different because they need a grade. Their lecturers actually come to validate as well what they do. They interview uh, the office staff, and they need to perform to graduate. So there's 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 this thing that ties them, good or bad, right? You you, you have this minimum, and then you when you actually talk to, we had a list of all the universities in Malaysia, all the different programs, and then we had this entire list of. Because the interns, the problem is scheduling. I mean, Wing Fu is used to have shitloads amount of headache. It's like, we need 25 to 30 all the time, but then the interns kind of like overlap. All right, some people, the internship starts like, you know, like March to, I don't know, March, April, May, and then some people starts in April, and so on and so forth. And then there, there will be like gap areas where like no uni or no program is having an internship period at that time. Then you kind of like supplement with, um, part-timers that we used to, used to get from asiaparttime.com and uh, so on and so forth. So it's, it's kind of like a learning process. Initially when we got one, we kind of asked them, what are your other friends doing? Like, you know, when, when do you intern again? Like, you know, what's, how your program works? Like, how long it is or whatever. So different uni as well. I think Petronas has the longest one with like six, eight months? Six months? Six months? So, yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's just kind of like evolution. Initially it was like, a, two, and then the next iteration we try to get five, and then the next iteration we get like 10. The system to get, and it's not, we don't offer the internship to everybody. <laughs> Trust me, we don't. Although we, we get like, you know, sustain like 30 plus or whatever. All the people in the company, the, the business development execs have a schedule. Every single day they'll be interviewing like two, two candidates on the phone, you know, like trying to see if it, 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 it works out. Huh? You. Hello. Uh, you seem like a very deep emotional guy, so I try and tap on that. <laughs> um, actually, I'm not like this with them though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good opportunity. Hey, um, sort of going back to your very, very early days, well before going live, okay. can you touch on the topic of doubt? I mean, as a founder, as someone who's starting out, I'm sure you go through I moments. Think, I, think, I think it goes back to your why, right? I think, I think it, it really goes back to your why. If your why is strong enough, I don't see a reason why you would doubt yourself because there's just no other option. You, you know what I'm saying? If I work today, I give you a, okay, this is, this is not a dig on Accenture, okay? This is not a dig on Accenture. The salary today, it's like, we used to get 3.5 for fresh grad. I think they're paying like 3.8 now after 10 years. Everything has fucking gone up. Hello. <laughs> and they're paying that kind of amount today. I mean like, I don't want to be working forever, per se. I don't want to be in that. So it, it, regardless, it's like, if I fail, I fail. It's fine, but I don't see any other way I would live my life. So some people do it for different reasons. Some people really want to change the industry, want to impact 
impact people or whatever. I just wanted to make sure that I have enough and my team has enough, then I'm happy. Right. Wow. That's awesome. But I, so just share with you guys, on top of that, there is a Chinese saying okay. that says that successful or not, a sincere approach is the only way. So that's about that. Master Eugene Till. <laughs> okay, <laughs> next one. Eugene, I uh, just wanted to know, like, what is your um, ethics or, or culture in educating the people that you're with? And like, what kind of education do you really uh, believe in providing your team? For us itself, it's, it was more, okay, if you ask them, their attitude wasn't that good anyway, when they restarted. <laughs> it's like, you know, kids, they just want to like, um, game all day. They just want to like, you know, go to movies or whatever, whatever. I think there's, there's this, we had a very good, um, because we had Tan, we had James, uh, we had like three people from Accenture and then like one from IBM, actually up to four from Accenture, I'm not, I, EV was there at that time. I think the top level actually uh, is very important to, to educate and you really have to spend time. I don't do anything, most of the time like after we actually was running uh, um, you know, at a full speed with 30 interns, most of my time is actually spending in the meeting rooms. I can have a schedule whereby I think I need to do one or two items, but the rest of the time is actually ad hoc stuff. We spoke about everything. Like we would, we would ask interns to come in and like, you know, tell them about this, that, this, that. Issues in the office people don't want to talk about. Uh, performance issues, like attitude wise, you know, just to, just to actually, you know, go through with them so that they actually improve. And we spent so much time just grooming and talking to people. Like, what do you want to do in your, with your life? And like, you know, can we give you this task? Do you think this is actually going to help you achieve where you want to be? Uh, you know, like, what, what are your interests are, like, you know, and, and if, if that person has a, a web tendency, we kind of introduce them to, to stuff that's web related, it might be AdWords, it might be, you know, SEO, whatever it is, and we actually do spend a lot of time there, because we felt that this is a window, a three months window, that we can actually see whether we, we hire or not, rather than getting someone outside, which we have no clue what the person is going to be like. Does that make sense? And when you get them young, it's 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 much easier, I guess. People people's mindset they they're not as fixed, I think. Yeah. It's just a lot of pain. I mean, like we had people took the company car for like you know datings. Like people like uh, went out to meet the dealers, and then we found out three days later they went for a, a three p.m. show at GSC. Those kind of stuff. It's like, but that, that's education as well, right? That's education as well. And I think it's it's actually you know you have to actually go through that as well. Um, hi there. Uh, hi Eugene. Uh, my name is Alan. Thanks for sharing with us your journey with no colleagues. So um, let me ask you this: If there's one thing that you would do differently before you start up colleagues, what would that be? I would. I would actually pick a different industry. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I. Why? It was. Kiss. We were like, you know, like we were there. If it's, if it's, if it was without. I mean, like you don't see the, the, the. How do I put it? When we got into college itself, when we at, at at the stage whereby you're new, there's a lot of other people that came before us. We had like others, car classifieds that didn't make it. So these are not like Mozart Trader. These are not like uh, Auto World. These are not like you know Muda or whatever. They they just came before, and it's. They don't last long. After three to four months, or whatever, they'll just go bust. So, we had such a huge. We, we we practically had to bag the dealers to take the listings. That was how bad it is. And now these guys on they're working on planning a wedding. It's up for like I don't know eight nine months already, right, right, right. I'm sorry, wedding got come to mind, but according to them, according to the revenue stats, traffic, we're the best. Thank you very much. I think your so, so, if you have any complaints, take it out on the CEO that tells me the traffic figures and around you or whatever. So I think what we learn, I guess, from here, it's like, you pick this industry, people are more tech savvy. They are very welcoming. They will just give you the money. They give you the opportunity. There, it's like, number one, uh, people that are selling cars, used cars, usually, you know, at that time, they were not that tech savvy. And there's a lot of people that came before them that didn't do a good job that we really have to beg. And I just can't tell you how hard it is. It's like, 
you go to a, a, a showroom uh, and they have like cars, huge amount of cars, and you see the cars in one day inventory, but they're all parked together, like blocking each other, whatever, and you, take, you try to take the best picture you can, and then you have to box someone to give you the price, the spec, the model, if it's not stuck on the windscreen. So it's a lot of pain, I would I put it that way. I, um, can relate to how your challenging tough is, uh, re retail is similar. I'm just curious though, uh, for, have you reached, I'm sure you have like stages of where there are two options, and sometimes you don't know which to choose. Uh, why are, are you selling burgers? Sorry? Why are you selling burgers? It's not just burgers, it's the f and industry. Then, then it has to be a reason why are you still in the industry? What right. is your goal? But in the sense of like, sort of business strategy, uh, in, in that sense, like... Um, will, will choosing A and B still lead you to where you want to go? Ideally? It's tough to have that foresight sometimes. I mean, but I'm, you're I'm, dumping yourself. Right. Right, you're dumping yeah. yourself, yeah. so you're taking a shortcut. Does that make sense? Trying to relate to that. Pardon me? Trying to relate to that. Yeah. Then it comes, that doubt comes because you, either you're too tired or you, you know, there's issues in the office or whatever it is, and then you feel that like there's two options and one is easier, but it's not the ideal scenario you want to take. That's right. why you have this doubt. So you really have to ask yourself the why is it import, important enough for you to carry on to take the harder path. For us itself it was very easy. Why we didn't sell the Patrick early on was because of valuation. It was not enough for everybody. It was just not enough for everybody. It was enough for me and my co-founder but it was really not enough for everybody. It was enough for the angels but it was not enough for everybody. So I, we didn't want to do it. That I saw paper related. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks. Hi. Um, my question is um, post exit. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, presumably, you've now got a huge financial war chest behind you. Um, could you they spend money like crazy. <laughs> now it's like, oh. <laughs> could you it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. To, could you speak a bit about what you're up to now and maybe a bit of your journey post exit? What happened after exit when you got you know, some finances behind you? How, what's your process? On to your next project. So like, um, how do I put this? We, when we actually, because initially everybody had jobs at uh, the, the, the group, right? iCar Asia, they had really good jobs, they, they paid really well, uh, because these are the team members. You have to imagine iCar Asia itself, Carlis is actually the, the main uh, HQ. All the death is actually coming out of Carlis in Thailand and Indonesia, just because the sites that we bought there is not as mature. So the HQ is actually in Bangsa UOA. So all the people are there, right? These guys had roles that some of them couldn't get out of immediately, but uh, right upon after, I think like, after I left, I think two, three months after, we realized that sooner or later, everybody will, will get back together. So it's just some people left first and then they started the, uh, the, the group that we have. The first project that we did was plan your wedding. We have two that's in the pipeline. Can I say the second one? I don't think so. I don't think so. We should. We should. It's live already somewhere. I think. No. No. I. I. I don't think we should say it. So like we're we'll, we'll doing two more and. Um, okay. What What I'm proud of is this. You don't take shortcuts. You don't take shortcuts. You make sure you exit and you exit well with your team. And these guys, they were like 25 year olds, and suddenly they are sitting on the huge amount of cash. Do I buy a Beamer or do I buy a house or whatever shit, right? But these guys opted to not spend the money to invest in the group to grow again. So it's kind of like we see people wanting to go in a startup field, right? And then they, they need some convincing. Either they are afraid because, or it's not feasible for them because of money. But these guys got it at this young age, and you see the conviction that they're actually going into this. It's awesome. So um, that's what they're doing right now. I think the business itself is not as important as the team and the structure that we're trying to get at. Why then an exit? Pardon me? Why then an exit? Why there was an exit? Yeah. 
I think uh, apart, apart from financially viable. Person. But but my reason was 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 financial. Right. Okay. So my reason was financial, and it was it was a really good time. Right. The price was really good, and uh, yeah, and then everybody was happy with it. I guess. I don't know how to. I don't. I personally, I personally don't know. I guess the people that we we recruit as well, we don't have a system whereby uh, we generate enough revenue that the profit is large enough that we split with the staff. What we do, we have to exit at a huge scale within four to five years because I don't want someone to be working in the company for ten years trying to profit share. Then it doesn't it doesn't make sense for us, lah. But some people, if if you have a restaurant. And you know your team is you know manageable, and you want to profit share. I think it's fine as well. Sorry, I didn't quite get the answer I wanted. Oh, the question didn't come out right. But okay. what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, because what we're doing now is a bit like what you were doing then, where you were introducing something that the market wasn't too sure about okay. what it is, what to make of it. My my question is, what what are you? Doing? Sorry, James. Sorry, what are you doing here? Can't talk about it too. Okay, no, I'm kidding. But we'll talk about it later. Um, but the point is, um, the, the okay, I'll guess. I'll guess. I'll yes. Guess, yeah. But the point is, you know, when when I when I ask about that, what I'm trying to get to is, to what extent do you push a team? I mean, like if you've got a team behind you and you're pushing them, and say they've given you two years of their life, for example, you know, how far do you go before you say, guys, the ship is not heading to the direction that I want it to go at? I think we. Or whatever it may be, but dealing with that doubt as you're progressing, did you encounter that? And if you did, how did you overcome that? You have to set like um, feasible milestones for yourself, for the company itself. As long as progressively, you it might delay, it's fine. But progressively itself, after three months, whatever, you hit a certain milestone. That's validation for you to continue, regardless if your money is your bleeding money, regardless if. Things don't look right. You have issues with uh, people, whatever, whatever. It is. Because ultimately, it, it's getting traction. You, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I, if you're talking about motivating people itself, are you hitting right? more more on the money side for now? But eventually, motivation will become a, because if there's no money, there's no motivation. You have to. How do I put it? If you go back to your financials. And this started very early on. I'll, I'll just grab them in the room, and then I'll say like, "These are the financials. This is the amount of money that we we are expected to make after you know one year, two years, three years, so on and so forth." They have to actually see it <laughs> because it's like a lot of people like, "Oh, they just think uh, had issues with this as well." People complain like, uh, "The founders don't want to share. They just give you equity, and you don't really know what your equity correlates to. Then you don't really know your market size." And you, you keep everything close, and then it's going to be very hard to actually motivate your guys, especially when the, the times are not that good. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Now, I just I just curious about uh, I guess more in the beginning when you said you know you raised five hundred thousand by valuing the company at a million. Uh, so what or what stage of the product were you at at the time? How much of it was based on traction? How much of it based on the business plan? Uh, and I guess how much did that plan kind of change? We didn't even have a domain. We didn't even have anything. It was just a business plan, and then I, you know, I pitched it to the first guy. The the guy wrote me like hundred thousand dollar check, and then I pitched it to the second guy. He he said he gave me a hundred thousand dollar. I I want to go back to like funding. Huh? It, it's very funny. It's like I go to my family friend, the uncle that is in the finance industry, and he keeps talking about all these numbers and whatever, so on and so forth. Then you go to your peers. Your friends that have known you well enough for many years, and they're already running businesses, and they're willing to actually bet on you. So a lot of times when people come to me and say like, I can't find funding, if among your circle that knows you so well, nobody is actually going to you know take a part on you, there is something there's an issue with yourself. So then you go back and build yourself first. I have to show to these people that I can do something X amount or whatever. It helps that I, I actually worked out. I mean, like if I actually just graduated and then I didn't go to Accenture, perhaps it's you know it would dilute uh, the the trust as well, right? If if it's an industry that I don't know because I worked in a, a, a car dealership for one and a half years, 
then it will dilute the trust as well. And I guess, you know, if I didn't know tech, I was just, you know, gonna wing it. I guess it, it will dilute as well. It's just a line that thing. If you ask me to do something about fashion or restaurant or whatever, I don't think people will give me money for that, unfortunately. So now that you've exited and, and so forth, right? Yeah. Um, what's the next bet? Where uh, do you make that money? These guys, it's, 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 okay, I know. It's a sizable amount. It's a crazy amount to be putting on these guys for a lot of people, but I just think it's like, you know, number one, I owe it to them for whatever I have today. Number two, I think it's like, if I can't trust them, who do I trust? So the, the business itself is irrelevant as long as they can continue to actually find talent, continue to actually groom, and continue to actually, you know, build an organization that we can actually, whatever it is, if it's sweeping the floor, uh, we'll just do it. I guess beside these guys, right? Yeah. I want to know like, who's the next one, or who are you clocking on now? The, yeah, the industry is big. There's a lot of stuff going on, big money. We big decided money. to actually, the group itself is working on three things, okay? I will give you like planyourwedding.my, all right? Uh, we, we, it's a finance thing that we're getting into, all right? We already did a JV. The last one, it's, it's, it's something else as well that we're, we're working on. If we have resources across time, then we will actually add, I mean like there's so many things we want to do, but we can only go as fast as we can actually recruit talent and we can actually, uh, yeah. how, about, how about what you want to do and it's outside? I don't know, it's like, this is the thing, it's like I'll be messaging him like 2 a.m. whatever, and it's like I'm so lost, oh, I'm very sad now. <laughs> I, uh, I, it's like, you know, I don't know what to do with my life and like, you know, I complain to them all the time and, and these guys know me really well. Uh, they're like family, so like, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm still finding out what I want to do. If I have an answer, then yeah, you know, I'll let you know. But I don't, I don't, I, I don't know what I want to do. It's like, I'm, I'm still finding out more about myself and what I like and what I don't like. Um, so I have a question regarding uh, determining whether you're, uh, you're the type that, you know, uh, that is actually uh, managing the tech stacks and you know, uh, you know, versus the the quality of a person who actually uh, brings business in. How would you actually determine that uh, uh, that you're a person who is a CTO type or? A CTO I don't. Type? I don't. So what happens is like if you're like the CEO, right? You're the founder. You have to understand where you're gonna spend your time that helps the team the most. You don't do something that somebody else can do. So I had a good uh, CTO, right? A co-founder, so I don't do that stuff. But if I couldn't find a guy, I would most probably start coding myself, right? So there's a lot of stuff like we just delegate as, uh, Goxen is really good with internet stuff. He knows he's like a walking encyclopedia of everything on the net. So, we just delegate. We, I don't focus anymore on that kind of stuff. It's, if it's like funding, if it's like HR, you know, early on we kind of train everybody to recruit, set up questions, what are we looking out for in the, across months. Then after that, I'm just hands off because that's not where I think I, you know, best uh, spend my time across uh, the life cycle of the company So Initially it was like me going out to take the car pictures and understanding whatever. Then when we recruited, I did something else. You know, then I, I did the accounts as well, you know, audited accounts and so on and so forth. Then we actually got people and trained, then I don't touch on that kind of stuff anymore. Initially I did I did products and, and marketing as well. And then after when we actually solidified that, that role itself, Elvin does the, the product, I don't touch that as well. Then there's a, ops is a huge headache with so many interns. I used to do that on a day to day basis. Then after we got people in, I don't touch that as well. So now my role is I don't go to, go to the group on a day-to-day -day basis, but on a week-to-week -week basis, I do see them at least once or twice. And it's more like at the high level, how to sustain X amount of people and the exit in the financials. Most sincerely, making a joke with Patrick Grove that I was still looking like for an interview that was like overcoming his interview, which my opinion was very full of good content. Okay, cool. And we've been having events with like 170, 200 people. And this time I wanted to restrict it like to a crowd and make it more Q&A, which aligned with what he asked to have more Q&A. 
And I'm really thinking that this was really one of the best we had lately. So I, thank I you very I, much. I, I think there's a huge uh, difference, right? I think there's a huge difference with, because she sent me a few links to actually look at what other people talk about. And uh, I guess you really have to find out your why. You look at all the people that has come on board, right? Like people from Kylie, uh, Patrick, and uh, Cheryl, so on and so forth. Everybody has a different reason why they're doing what they're doing. So you really have to identify with your why. What are you trying to, you know, do? And then I, I guess that will actually uh, ensure that you actually go the distance. That's so good. Thank you so much. <laughs>